and your bride are right, they have asked us how Joab and the army were getting along and how the war was progressing. Then you told Uriah, go on home and relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night in the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night? being away for so long. Uriah replied, the army and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. We'll stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow we may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, Station Uriah on the front lines for the battle with Spearsis, and pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall that he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Then Joab sent a battle report to David. He told his messenger, report all the news of the battle to the king. But he might get angry and ask, why did the troops go so close to the city? Didn't they know there would be shooting from the walls? Wasn't Abelot, son of Gideon, killed at Thebes by a woman who threw a millstone down on him from the wall? Why would you get so close to the wall? Then tell him Uriah the Hittite was killed too. So the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave a complete report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said. As we chased them back to the city gate, the archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Joab not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. The Lord was displeased with what David had done. The word of God for all people everywhere. Thanks be to God. Now, a little bit of science for you today. Avalanches. They're masses of snow, snow, ice, and rocks that fall rapidly down a mountainside. They can be deadly. That was the definition given by a writer for National Geographic. To say the least, avalanches, masses of snow and rocks and ice falling rapidly down a mountainside, they can be deadly. So, now, while avalanches are beautiful to witness from afar or on the TV, uh, they can be deadly because of their intensity and seemingly unpredictability. The recipe for an avalanche might seem simple, a mountain slope and a thick layer of snow. To be more exact, the slope must have at least a 30 degree incline, though they more frequently occur uh, with slopes 35 to 50. So, like, if that's 45, right, then, you know, so it likes sort of that. So that's all the slope that it needs. But uh, then there's also a, uh, that thick layer of snow. Uh, you need a surface bed of snow, a weaker layer that can co collapse, uh, and, that, and an overlaying snow slab. Terrain, snowpack, and weather conditions also are factored in uh, to what might create an avalanche. One thing leads to another. And they contain, avalanches contain three main features. You've got the starting zone. Where the avalanche is launched from makes sense, uh, hence the name. And that's typically the most unstable part of the slope. Then you have the avalanche track. That's the natural path it follows downhill, leaving large clearings and missing trees. And then the runout zone. Guess what that is? <laughs> that's the end of the road where the avalanche finally comes to a complete stop, leaving a pile of snow and debris. Avalanches come in all shapes and sizes. Small slides of powdery snow moving as a formless mass downslope, more of a slough than an avalanche. 
Then you have the medium-sized ones. And then you have the ones which race down the mountain up to 100 miles per hour with enough momentum to cross flat terrains for short distances. And not only can they be fast, they can be heavy. Uh, the deadly, one of the deadliest uh, avalanches at Mount Everest sent a mass of snow and ice down the mountainside weighing 31.5 million pounds. Now try to figure out a reference. They had given like buses, but how much does a bus weigh? That's 1,291 school buses. Avalanches are beautiful to witness from afar. <laughs> some do occur naturally, uh, some caused by earthquakes. Others occur when forest rangers blast howitzers at, uh, or other military artillery at unstable snowpacks to trigger the avalanches in a safe, controlled manner, no people present. And some avalanches occur, occur because of humans. <laughs> In fact, humans trigger 90% of avalanche disasters. Well, snowboard, snowboards, skis, snowmobiles, e even snowshoes, somebody walks or rides over that slab with the underlying weak layer. The weak layer collapses, causing over the overlaying mass of snow to fracture and start to slide. Avalanche! One thing leads to another. Of course, learning about avalanches and the conditions which cause them will aid in not causing a disastrous avalanche, in avoiding areas which have all the factors of becoming a disastrous avalanche, and allow people to live and to have fun, to recreate more safely. These are the tips for how to survive an avalanche. Heed the warning signs. Uh, the, the article says, don't give in to the psychological trappings like desiring the ultimate ski slope untouched by any other human. Constant vigilance. You got to be paying attention to what's going on around you and in you. And I love this one. If you're in the avalanche track, get out. <laughs> avalanche experts, though, say, uh, best case scenario, it's difficult. They say, reach for a tree. If there's no tree, swim hard. And humans, you're going to sink in the snow. We're denser than snow. And so keep clearing a space to breathe. Punch your hands skyward. And if you aren't out by then, wait and hope for a rescue. Well, that sounds, uh, that sounds comforting. So they have trained some rescue dogs for that. One of the avalanche experts says, snow is an incredibly dynamic and complicated medium, which means avalanches are the same. Why the science lesson about avalanches? Well, truth be told, it, it was a science lesson about avalanches or me singing uh, the fixes, one thing or another. Uh, one thing, one thing leads to another. 1983 song, anybody, anybody? Google it. So now, you might have made the connection between avalanches and today's scripture. Uh, it seems to me, though, that King David managed to start an avalanche of sin. One thing that would be more than, that, that there was sort of that one thing that was kind of that small, well, it would be more than a small slough. Uh, it would accelerate. It would ex be exceeding 100 miles per hour, mulling over anything and everything in its track and dropping more than 31.5 million pounds of destruction when it reached its runout zone, if it has even reached its runout zone. Sin is an incredibly dynamic and complicated medium, which means sin and avalanches are much the same. Before we explore David's disastrous avalanche, let's pause for a moment and pray. Magnificent God, the creator of the cosmos, the one who uniquely created each and every snowflake in each and every one of us, open our hearts and minds to the Holy Spirit that we might hear what you have to say to us individually and as a church. I pray, Holy Spirit, remove anything which might distract us, tiredness, pain, anxiety, worry, shopping lists, what's for lunch, and bring focus and alertness. Holy Spirit, speak in us and to us, and speak in me and to me, that you might speak through me or in spite of me. And may the words of my mouth come from you. May I decrease, that you might increase. May the proclaiming and hearing of your word bring you glory and bring us closer to you. All for you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, 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 what do we have here? Quite a story. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the, those are the days of our lives. Now, I, I want to do a, a quick recap. 
It's quick. David anointed king of Israel when he was just a boy tending his father's sheep. He was said to be a man after God's own heart, a man of God's own choosing. Thing was, there was already a king over Israel, Saul, and David would wait his turn. And, and he waited rather patiently. In fact, he served as Saul's weapon bearer. He even played the harp for Saul to, to, to ease his nerves. And even when Saul kept trying to kill David, uh, David stayed loyal to Saul, stayed loyal to Israel, didn't take Saul out when he had the opportunity. Well, there was one time when he joined the Philistine army for safety, but, but he never fought against Israel. Well, David proved to be a mighty warrior, a hero. Uh, he took down a giant with one stone in, in a sling. Uh, David fought the guy that everyone else was too afraid to fight. And actually, though, David proclaimed that the battle was the Lord's, that the victory was the Lord's. And he wasn't fighting that, that giant. He was fighting that the name of the Lord would no longer be disgraced. David would also prove to be quite the military leader, always being victorious. Time and time again, David would inquire of the Lord what to do. God would tell him, and David was obedient. He was also very loyal to his best friend, Jonathan. Jonathan was King Saul's son and was supposed to inherit the throne. Well, that's how it normally went. Even so, though, Jonathan would help David escape Saul, both of them loyal to the end. Uh, in fact, and, and, and I almost preached this this week, um, David would take in one of Jonathan's sons as his own to eat at his table, Mephibosheth. You didn't want to have to read that name, did you? <laughs> anyway, Mephibosheth, 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 I could say it, but now I can't. That, that, Jonathan's son, uh, when they were running for, for safety, uh, he was dropped by uh, one of the servants, and so he, was, he had been crippled. Uh, that, that would have been um, disastrous uh, for him in regard to being treated as less than human, but King David took him in, let him sit at his table. And so David anointed king of Israel. He brought Israel and Judah back together in the city of David, a united kingdom. And now it was time to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to its rightful place. The Ark, the God box, uh, the throne of God, God seated on the mercy seat, uh, his, his presence with the people. Well, David forgot to inquire of the Lord at that time. Maybe he'd gotten a, a little too big for his britches, and there was a little snafu. It was a big snafu. But uh, having recovered from that, David asked the Lord about bringing the ark and, and later about building a temple. God said, bring the ark, wait on the temple. So in summary, we have David, an upstanding man who was loyal to the Lord, loyal to his country, loyal to the army, loyal to his friends, loyal to the king. David, a man of integrity and might, a victor, a hero, unafraid. David, a man of God's own choosing, the spiritual leader of the people of Israel, a man who seeks the Lord, who worships the Lord with all his might. Wow. So much for being a king like all the other nations, though it seems, it seems though, with this, that David, King David, fits that bill of being a king set apart. But how the mighty fall. That's where we pick up the story. I, I typed ugh. I don't even know if ugh is the right word uh, for this story, uh, this truth in scripture, this, this story that the biblical writers did not leave out. Uh, I can hear the voiceover, the, the narrator at the beginning. It was spring. The rains had stopped. There would be time before men would be needed to harvest the fields. Instead, this is when the kings would normally go to war in the killing fields. And then the scene picks up, David in full stretch before his servants and the commander of his army, Joab. He had reached, the commentators say he had reached his 50s. Some of his advisors had encouraged him not to engage in battle. And besides, he had already proven himself to be a mighty warrior. Joab also proved himself to be quite capable of bringing victory to Israel. So he looks at Joab and says, you take the reins this year. Well... It's all too often the case that a sense of ease and security are a prelude to spiritual and moral failure. The feeling of being invincible and indispensable certainly makes one prideful with a sense of power that, that no one can resist and no one can touch, no one can take away. Now for Joab, it must have felt good for the king to give him that much responsibility. Probably a bit terrifying as well. But nonetheless, the armies go off and David takes a nap. One thing leads to another. Now granted, there is some debate as to whether David was being disobedient or shirking his duties as a king by staying home. After all, one of his duties as king is to fight for his people. 
And even if he weren't engaging in direct combat, surely he'd be useful for strategic planning. Father Mike Schmitz, uh, uh, he's a, a young priest at the, at the University of Minnesota, I believe, but he says, sin starts by not doing our daily duty, not attending to the task at hand. David wasn't attending to the task at hand. Uh, even if he wasn't out to war, surely there was work to be done as king, and he's taking a nap. One thing leads to another. Here nor there, uh, David not being with the troops, uh, did offer the temptation of being idle. Henry David Thoreau, the devil finds work for idle hands, and oh, how the devil found work for David's idleness. Lounging on the rooftop while men are off fighting, while the Ark of the Covenant, God enthroned on the mercy seat, is in a tent on a battlefield, David reclined on a couch in a cool breeze. Surely there was work to be done in Jerusalem, caring for the people of Israel, but alas, he wakes from his nap to take a walk, not through the city streets, but on the roof, pacing to and fro, no real purpose. He's not even using the opportunity on, on the rooftop to, to look over the city. And they, they say that, that his palace would have the tallest uh, roof, so he could indeed uh, look out and, and see the whole city. But there is something that catches his eye. A woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. David didn't look away. He took a second, possibly a third look, instead of covering his eyes and heading inside to take a cold shower. One thing leads to another. It starts with David not doing what he's supposed to be doing, instead indulging in, in comfort. Not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, but uh, it, it had taken over uh, his responsibilities. One thing leads to another, one step closer to that patch of snow that starts the avalanche. Then he starts looking where he shouldn't be looking. One thing leads to another. He steps on that, uh, that top layer of snow. Now, I want to take a moment to clear something up, and this is really important. It's often been taught that Bathsheba was on the roof bathing. Nowhere does it say that. That, that she was on the roof to seduce the king, to, to try to see what she could get out of, uh, of a relationship with the king. She has been painted as a really bad girl in the Bible. That, that's a title given to her by Christian writer and comedian Liz Curtis Higgs. She's been listed among the ranks of, of Eve and Delilah and Jezebel. That's wrong, absolutely wrong, totally, absolutely wrong, completely, totally, absolutely wrong. You get it? <laughs> Scripture tells us that, that the bathing is a part of the purification rites after having her menstrual cycle. There's no indoor plumbing, uh, so Bathsheba is likely bathing in the courtyard of her house, surrounded by walls, uh, and, and really the men are out to war, so, so there's no real opportunity that any would come barging through. She has no thought that anyone be, would be looking on this ritual bath. It's not a bubble bath. Leviticus 15 will tell you the process of that ritual pur purification. David wasn't looking over the city. He was staring at a naked woman of unusual beauty. One thing leads to another. And now he starts inquiring where he shouldn't be asking. Who is this woman? Well, King David, <laughs> she is Bathsheba. Ring a bell? Her dad is Eliam, a member of your special cadre of mighty men. His father was one of your top advisors. You know her, re remember. Her husband, she's married. She's married to Uriah the Hittite, Hittite uh, another one of your mighty men of value, valor, one of those 30 men who've been with you all along, who've been loyal. David probably knew who she was before he asked. But why even ask? The answer didn't change the outcome. One thing leads to another. That, that snow was headed downhill fast. He sent messengers to get her. And when she got to the palace, what does scripture say? He slept with her. It doesn't seem like there was any small talk, whining and dining, or even foreplay. There's a saying that people use today that I've decided that I won't say, because it might be offensive, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, Marilyn said not to. So, anyway... Just like that, scripture says she returns home. This was not some romantic tryst. Bathsheba with stars in her eyes, batting her eyelids at the king. Some, some view this event as mutual consent, but it wasn't. 
Bathsheba may have went willing, and why wouldn't she? Grandfather and advisor, father, one of the mighty men, Uriah, one of the mighty men. Like, why shouldn't she trust him? She might have, you know, she, she may never have uttered the word no or stop. She might not have even fought back. But know that Bathsheba, a woman with a name, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah the Hittite, did not have a choice. You can't say no to a king, to the king, especially if you're a woman. <clears throat> he abused his position and power, and in today's vernacular, it would be defined as rape, as power rape. We've uh, seen a lot of that in the news, haven't we? One thing leads to another. Suffice it to say, I think the avalanche has started down the slope, breakneck speed, taking out trees and everything in its path. Later, Bathsheba finds out that she's pregnant. Remember uh, the ritual bathing uh, after her period? That comes seven days, uh, and that has ended. David sleeps with her. She would have been the most fertile at that time. Not that he cared. Now, there were no home pregnancy tests, uh, and I've never been pregnant. I don't know, but it could have been upward of six weeks or more uh, until she realized that she was pregnant. There would be no denying that the baby's father was not Uriah. Remember, he's on the killing fields. And she, of course, would know it was David. And all of this would have brought great fear to her. <clears throat> the penalty for adultery was to be stoned. And it would be he said, she said. And he was King David. Guess who wins that argument? One thing leads to another. What else is there to do but let the baby's father know? Now, I imagine that scene from the 1988 coming-of-age movie For Keeps with Molly Ringwald. Uh, she and her boyfriend, they're expecting, uh, surprisingly, uh, both families surrounded Thanksgiving dinner, and, uh, well, they end up getting sort of pushed into having to share the news, and uh, Molly Ringwald, Darcy <laughs> said, uh, I'm pregnant. Can you please pass the turnips? Well, I, I don't know how uh, Bathsheba broke the news to David. But David is informed that he is the father. And I wonder, does he even remember the encounter? A child conceived out of his own lustful desires, not attending to the daily tasks, idle hands, idle eyes, looking where he shouldn't look, asking where he shouldn't ask, and then, um, then taking what was not his. One thing leads to another. No getting off that slab of snow and ice hurling down the mountain at warp speed. But David tries. This honorable man of integrity, the military, political, and spiritual leader of God's chosen people, immediately hatches a plan to cover up his sinfulness. Bathsheba, how are you doing? Oh my goodness. Well, plan A, bring Uriah home, give him a gift, have him sleep with her. Problem solved. Except Uriah, a man of integrity, loyal to his king, to the Lord, and to the army, doesn't leave the palace entrance. Now, mind you, uh, it was called for the soldiers to remain celibate when they went off to war. That's what Uriah was doing. One thing leads to another. Plan B. Let's get Uriah drunk and see if he'll go home and sleep with his wife. But Uriah's loyalty, more than skin deep, a little bit of alcohol wasn't going to, to have him... Uh, have him uh, be, become disloyal, have him uh, go into his wife and, um, and, uh, ooh, the word slipped me, and not be who he is supposed to be. One thing leads to another. Plan C, send Uriah back to the killing fields with a letter uh, for Joab, uh, Uriah's death warrant, as it were. Not strategic plans for, for victory, but to leave Uriah out high and dry. You know, advance everybody in and then pull back. Oh my goodness. So, that's some strategy. One thing leads to another. We just watched that avalanche, not beautiful from afar, uh, but quite disastrous. Joab, loyal to the king, not really knowing what else to do, carries out the plan. It takes out more than just Uriah. We're not told the death toll. Uh, and those other guys, they were also some of David's best. But the report of those deaths didn't faze him. He was just looking to hear that one name. Uriah the Hittite is dead. One thing leads to another. He lets Bathsheba mourn the, 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 the period of mourning. And I didn't write it down, but I think somebody said that's like seven days. But then what does he do? 
takes her into the palace and makes, him, makes her his wife. I can imagine that was a happy wedding. <laughs> well, it's still a cover-up. Surely he's going to tell everybody that eight-pound baby was born prematurely. One thing leads to another, starts with not taking care of the task at hand. We, too, find ourselves tempted. We find ourselves uh, wanting to, to give in to our desires even when we know that, that they go against all that God wants for us, all that God has for us. And each of those, one thing leads to another. But it starts with not taking care of the task at hand. You know what the task at hand is for us, is for people who believe in Jesus Christ, who call themselves disciples? The task at hand is to worship God, is to, is to um, gather together in fellowship, is to, is to read and study scripture, is to, to, um, to receive, to take uh, the Lord's Supper, to share the gospel, to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Christ. That's the task at hand. And what happens when we don't take care of the daily task at hand? <clears throat> Sin enters in. And it becomes a slippery slope. It becomes an avalanche. One thing leads to another until we, we no longer are willing to, to call what we do sin, what we do immoral, um, until we get to that place where, where, we, where we begin to, to, to decide that Scripture really didn't mean that for us. <laughs> we get to that place where we take the grace of Jesus Christ uh, and we allow that to give us permission to live immoral lives, to, to keep on sinning. We're studying the book of Jude on Wednesday nights, and that's how it starts out. Not taking care of the task at hand, not knowing Jesus, not knowing God's word, not worshiping together, not fellowshipping together, not holding one another accountable, the daily task at hand, denying ourselves and taking up our cross. That's where sin starts. And just like David the avalanche begins taking out things in its path and also taking us out. Scripture, Jesus says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but that he came that we might have life and life abundantly. The thief, Satan, our, our, our evil desires, our sin, kill, steal, and destroy. But being a disciple, calling on Christ, that's that life abundant. Now, we will continue this story next week. We will see uh, David, uh, David on his face before the Lord. But I felt it necessary uh, today to just focus on, on that avalanche, to just focus on, on how one thing leads to another for David and for us, and to call us to a place of confession, to call us to a place where we are aware of the choices that we are making, where we seek the Lord in the choices that we are making, and we choose correctly. We choose to be obedient. We choose to live in line with Scripture, and if we're not, we change. It's hard. So, uh, I offer you the challenge this week. Uh, I begin uh, with the lyrics. Uh, uh, Google it, slow fade by casting crowns. It's a slow <laughs> fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices are made, a price will be paid. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. King David didn't start out as an adulterer, a rapist, a murderer, a conniver, a slimy guy. Uh, in fact, he was chosen to... To be, he was chosen by God to be king. And he had proved himself to be honorable, loyal, heroic, a man of integrity. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Uh, it's the second glance that ties your hands and darkness pulls the string. It's a slow fade. David, it really was that second glance. And we find ourselves in that same position. We find ourselves tempted, maybe not to commit adultery or murder, or, uh, but tempted to lie, to, to bend the rules, to, to find ourselves... Uh, cheating, to be selfish with our time, money, stuff, love, compassion, to gossip. We find ourselves tempted to put God on the back burner, to tuck God away until we need him, or until Sunday morning for the hour plus. <laughs> it's a slow fade, and one thing, one thing leads to another. Once you start, it's not easy to stop. You can't stop an avalanche. So, 
spend time in prayer this week, truly asking God to reveal those places where your life is in the midst of a slow fade, where you've continually made uh, choices in opposition to God's word. And as God reveals those places, confess your sins, repent, that means change, uh, and ask for forgiveness. And this week, pause before you make decisions. Inquire of the Lord. Ask if the choice that you are making will glorify God or is it sinful. And then choose to glorify God. <laughs> Let's not allow the gospel to fade away by allowing it to, 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 to um, by allowing ourselves to crumble, by allowing ourselves uh, to, to, um, to forsake the task at hand every day of being a disciple. As we uh, prepare to, to go forth into this world, um, we'll be singing. It's a new song uh, for us, and you may have heard it before. It's about blessings, and it's about the, the, the different ways and different times and different places where, where we find blessings uh, that, um, that when we're not looking for them. And uh, think about um, the life of Bathsheba and, and even the life moving forward with David and what blessings may uh, come from that. And so I invite you as you're able to stand and join in singing. Just a quick yes. note, I'm going to stop these. Um, Glenn is um, needing some help, so...